Chapter 22. Captain Smith, you shall find Pohatan to use you kindly, but trust him not, for he hath sent for you only to cut your throats. Chief of the Warasayaks quoted in William Simmons' E.D. the proceedings. Our trouble starts when winter sets in. If we had more skilled farmers and hunters, and if we all worked at farming and hunting, we might be able to produce enough food to get us through the winter. But as it is, our men are kept busy searching for gold, digging sassafras, and making clapboard, glass, pitch, tar, and soap ashes to ship back to England in the hopes that something in the lot will make a profit for the Virginia Company. And to make things worse, when Captain Newport lives, leaves in December, he takes a lot of our food stores with him, saying he and his sailors will need them for the long voyage home. At least he takes Captain Ratcliffe as well and rids us of him. When our barrels are close to empty, Captain Smith goes to trade with the natives for grain, but he comes back empty-handed. Chief Pahatan has commanded all of his tribes not to trade with us. He is wielding his power, says Captain Smith. He is showing us that the crowning ceremony angered him and that his power is not diminished by it. We will see what else he plans to do. We are allowed one cup of grain for each person each day. I am always hungry. I often think of the feast at Werowakamaka and wish I was there again. Richard and I dig up sassafras roots to chew on to ease our hunger. Then we talk about food, trying to use our minds to fill our bellies. My mom used to make Yorkshire pudding at Christmas time, I say, with the crust just a little brown and loads of gravy. Richard closes his eyes, imagining, I remember All Saints Day at the orphanage, he asks, when we had stew with enough meat in it so everyone got some. We talk about the birds and fish we roasted in Nev on Nevis, and I tell him again about the mounds of peas, squash, and venison at the Werewakamaka's feast. Soon our jaws are tired from chewing on the sassafras roots, and for a time our bellies are fooled into thinking we have eaten. Then one day we have good news, or what seems like good news. Two natives arrive to tell us that Chief Powhatan is ready to trade. He will give us food if we bring him what he wants, a grindstone, a rooster, and a hen, copper, beads, 50 swords, several muskets, and workmen to build him an English-style house. He knows we are hungry enough that Captain Smith might well give him all he wants, including the weapons. President Smith rubs his forehead and says quietly, We are desperate for the food. To the messengers in Algonquin, he says, Tell Chief Powhatan we come, give things he wants. But as the messengers walk away, he says in English, Except the guns and swords, I will throw in some extra gifts instead. I smile, watching the battle of wills become between Captain Smith and Chief Powhatan is like watching the dance of a sword fight between two proud, powerful men. We load up two barges in this discovery for the trip to Werowakamaka. We hope to bring all three of the vessels back laden with food. The first night we stop at the Werowakamaka village and are welcomed as guests. Chief Sassenticum shares his pipe of tobacco with Captain Smith and shares some advice as well. I listen hard to understand the Algonquin words. Chief Pahant will treat you kindly, but do not trust him, he says. He has sent for you only to slit your throats. Captain Smith does not seem surprised, and I realize he has already guessed that this might be a trap. We keep guns ready, he says in his choppy Algonquin. Then he looks at me. I leave boy with you, he asks Chief Sesson to come. I sent messenger to him. If I dead, boy, go to Jamestown, tell others. This chills me to my bones. I want to object to tell Captain Smith not to go. Why is he willingly walking into a trap? We are surviving on our grain. I want to tell him Captain Newport will be back soon. Let us all return to Jamestown tomorrow and wait for the supply ship. But I didn't say anything. It is not my place. Chief says sent to come. Agrees. Captain Smith and the other men will go to Werowakamaka in the morning. I will stay in the Werowakamaka village and wait. If Captain Smith is killed, I return to Jamestown to bring the news. Next morning, I watch the Discovery sail away with Captain Smith at her helm. 
I wonder if it will be the last time I see him. I pushed on sadness. I have already lost Reverend Hunt. I don't want to lose Captain Smith as well. To tell, I tell myself that he is will, willy, wily and smart and will not easily fall into Chief Pahant's trap. The Warascoyak village is a busy place when I wa- and I want to do my share of the work. But when I try to help out girls with her, their pounding of corn into meal, Kanta, Chief Sesentikum's son, pulls me away. That work is for the women to do, he says. I will show you men's work. He takes me into the forest. There is a thin layer of snow on the dead leaves, and my feet crunch loudly on them. He stops and looks at me frowning. You are very loud, he says. He inspects my shoes. My mother will make you moccasins. He looks around, finds a sapling that seems to be just right for what he is searching for, and cuts it down with his hatchet. I will teach you how to make a bow and arrows, he says. Working with wood and stone is a good way to keep my mind off what might be happening to Captain Smith. Kainta teaches me how to peel the bark off the sapling, cut notches for the bowstring, and string it with strong gut. We make several arrow shafts from stone straight thin wood he shows me how to make an arrowhead chipping a piece of rock until it is the right shape it is a slow process and i ruin several pieces of rock before i get it right but finally i am able to make my first arrowhead then i tie it to the shaft and balance the shaft with feathers so that it will shoot straight when we grow hungry we go to the communal cook fire there we find a large clay pot filled with hominy and venison stew, fish on the grill, and bread baking in the hot ashes on the ground. Eat, says Kainta. He tears off a piece of bread and uses an oyster shell to scoop stew right out of the pot. I do the same. It is delicious. This is what I have seen people do all day, just come up to the pot and take what they want to eat. I realize that they have no meal times, no rationing of food, and I think that these Pahant people... Must be the wealthiest people on the earth. A young woman comes to put a new loaf of bread in the ashes and to stir the pot of stew. She wears a kind of apron made of deer skin that hangs down to her knees. Her arms, face, and legs have colorful tattoos of patterns, flowers, fruits, and snakes. Her black hair is plaited into one long braid hanging down to her hips. She smiles shyly. At me, how strange I must look to her um, in my English clothes. No messenger comes that day or the next. I don't know if this is good news or bad. I have no choice but to wait. At sunrise, I go with Kainta down to the river where he bathes in the frigid water. I stay shivering on the shore. Kainta sprinkles a bit of tobacco on the river, closes his eyes and lifts his hands, and I know he is praying. This is what Namantak did each morning when he lived with us in Jamestown. The days go by, and I learn more about men's work, which is mostly about hunting and fishing. I am also careful to learn what shores are women's work, so that I will not embarrass myself again by trying to do any of it. Planting, weeding, harvesting, making clay pots, cooking, making clothes is all for the girls and women to do. Kainta teaches me how to make a knife by chipping a piece of rock until it is sharp, then trying tying it with gut into a short stick. He gives me a buckskin pouch and shows me how to hang it from my waist with a leather strap. My knife fits nicely inside. I continue to make my arrows, chipping the arrowheads and trying tying the feathers until I have enough to go hunting. Kainta shows me how to weave a case so that I can carry my arrows on my back. He has me practice with my bow and arrows and a target until I can shoot straight. It shows. Kainta says this will make hunting even easier because we will see the animals' tracks in the snow. I have my new moccasins and I walk carefully heel to toe, the way he has shown me, trying to be as silent as he is. I am concentrating so hard that at first I do not notice someone else who has been walking quietly in the forest. Then suddenly I look up and see him. Now I'm intact. I cry out. I'm very glad to see him. Then, when I realize why he has come, I am filled with fear. He is the messenger from Werewakamaka. I stand, gripping my bow, waiting for the bad news. Namentek smiles. Do not look so worried, Samuel. Your master sends good wishes. 
I groan with relief. Then I am confused. Why have you come and not Captain Smith? I ask him in English. He answers me in a goth I am in his world now. Captain Smith says you will stay with the Waras Goyaks through the winter. He, we will learn more of the language and eat well. Kanta joins us. He and Namatak exchange the greeting of countrymen. With one fist, each taps first his own chest, then forehead, and then taps the other boy's chest and forehead. Come, says Kanta, you must be hungry after your journey. We will hunt later. We sit with Namatak at the communal cook fire as he eats. I form my questions in Algonquin. Chief Pahant and make trap? I ask him. Now that I have heard the good news, I'm ready to hear the whole story. Yes, Namatak says, but you're Werewens is quick as a rabbit. The trap did not catch it, he grins. He likes Captain Smith as much as I do. In between mouthfuls, Namatak tells us what happened. Captain Smith and his men arrived in Awara Wakamaka and were treated kindly. They traded for lots of corn, but by the time their boats were loaded up, the tide was out and the boats couldn't move. They had to spend the night in Awara Wakamaka, staying in one of the houses. Just after dark, Captain Smith heard a sound at the door. It was Pocahontas. Her eyes were wide with terror. You must go, she said. In a little while, my father's men will bring you food. As soon as you put your weapons down and begin to eat, they will slit your throats with your own swords. And if they don't succeed, they will be a bigger attack. there will be a bigger attack later. She begged them to leave right away. She was crying. She knew that if she was caught warning Captain Smith, her father would have her put to death. She may have been plain play acting the first time, I think, but this time she really did risk her life to save Captain Smith. The tide was still too low for them to leave. Within an hour, ten strong warriors came with platters of food, just like Bocantus had said they would. The warriors said the slow matches on the Englishmen's guns were smoking up the room, making them sick, and they should put them out, but Captain Smith just said, oh, we don't mind the smoke. Then he made the warriors taste all the food to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Captain Smith and his men ate their supper with their guns smoldering and ready. And later, big attack, I ask. Nemtech tells us how the Englishmen kept up a guard half the night, standing with their muskets ready. There never was an attack. At midnight, the tide had ri risen enough to move the boats and they left. So Captain Smith's men are safe and they have taken corn back to Jamestown. Thank you. Good news, I say to Namatak. It has begun to snow again, and Namatak is inviting to stay the night. He's is invited to stay the night. He sleeps in the family house with Kainta and me. The next day, the three of us go hunting. We walk quietly through the for white forest, stalking rabbits. We see one even I have been quite quiet enough not to startle it. Kainta and Namatak both look at me. They want me to shoot to have a chance to make my first kill. Silently, I pull out an arrow and string it to my bow. I make my breath even and slow so that it will not affect my shot. I watch the rabbit as it hops along in the undergrowth, looking for food. I pull back the bowstring and aim. Then I let the arrow fly. There is a whoosh and a thud. The arrow hits its mark. The hair lies still. Blood seeps out where my arrow has entered its side, staining the snow bright red. Kainta claps me on the back. You have learned well, he says. I am still amazed at what I have done. Good, ta go, take your prize and give thanks to the god Ochius for your meat, says Namatak. I tie the rabbit's behind feet, rabbit's hind feet to a piece of gut and hang it around my waist. We hunt some more. And the other two boys also get rabbits. The winter day is short when the sun sinks down, casting long shadows over glittering snow. It is time to return to the village. I use my knife to cut open the rabbit's abdomen and clean out its entrails and to peel the rabbit's skin away from the meat. My rabbit, which I have killed myself with a weapon I made myself, becomes part of the communal stew that evening. It makes me feel proud and strong. Namintak goes home to Werewakamaka and I stay at the Weraskyak. Wers Raskoyak village, as Captain Smith has prescribed. Kainta and I do more hunting. He shakes his head when he sees me trying to keep my hair, which is getting long, quite long, out of my way. He asks his mother to cut my hair for me. She takes two muscle shells and grates away the hair 
on the right side of my head down to the scalp. It pinches and pulls, but I keep still. On the left side, she leaves it long, and she cuts a, a ridge of short hair down the middle of my head so that my hair looks very much like the other men and boys. There, says Kinta. Now it will not get caught in your bowstring. When the winds of February blow cold, I wear a mantle of deerskin. During the March thaw, I kill my first wild turkey. Kinta ties two of its feathers into the long side of my hair. In late April, when the mosquitoes, flies, and gnats come out, Kinta shows me how to layer a, a how a layer of bear, bear grease mixed with a powder of red pukun root keeps the bugs away. It also makes my skin red. I no longer look very much like an English boy. One day, we boys are playing a game that is much like English football. We have a goal at each end of a field, and we kick a ball made up of skins, trying to score by kicking the ball into the other team's goal. I have finally gotten tired of sweating in my slops and long-sleeved shirt during these games and have let Kainta's sister make me a buckskin breech cloth to wear. The red pukun dye protects my back, chest, arms, and legs from insects and the burning of the sun, and my moccasins protect my feet from running. The right side of my hair has been nearly sh newly shaved by Kainta's mother, and the left side of my hair is quite long, almost to my shoulder. I've added a few shells to the feathers as ornaments. As we play, I hear a call of wingapo, wing wingapo, Spoken with an English accent, I stop running. I have almost forgotten what English speech sounds like. What I see takes my breath away. It is Richard, Nathaniel, Henry, Abram, and several others. They look thin and wan. They are walking toward us. Richard calls out, speaking Algonquin, as if he has memorized just what to say. Captain Smith send, need eat, find English boy, Samuel. I sputter, Richard, I call to him, it's me. Richard's eyes go wide and his mouth drops open. By God, he's turned into a savage, Henry says. I ignore Henry and go to greet Richard and the others. The Indian boys gather around us. Are you here to bring me back? I ask, still not understand why they have come. Richard shakes his head. Are you here to stay for a while, too? Eat. Rats got into the grain. There are so many of them, they look like maggots squirming in the barrels. We have almost nothing left. So President Smith has sent us different places. Some he sent up to the river to live on oysters, some down the river to Point Comfort to live on fish, and some to friendly tribes. We got sent here. We have copper to pay our way. I translate as best as I can for Kainta. He nods and says he will go tell his father that they are here. So, Richard eyes me curiously, did that stuff just get stuck in your hair, or did you put it there on purpose? I sock him playfully in the arm, and we both laugh. I think of how I want to teach him what I have learned, how to make snares to catch beavers, otters, and squirrels, how to build a fire in a canoe at night so the fish will be mesmerized and come close so we can spare, spear them, how to find mushrooms and roots and berries that are good to eat. I know that with the knowledge I've gained from living with the Werewasp, Oh, yaks, we don't ever have to be hungry again.